friends, just to, and they are recording. So, um, um, salam alaikum and, and welcome, welcome. It's my honour to be chairing this uh, wonderful event for Scottish Interfaith Week, put together by our friends at the Scottish Hello, Bayet Society. Now, at the outlet, uh, I need to, to give apologies for Shabir Beg, who unfortunately can't be with us um, because his daughter's father-in-law has just passed away. Um, and that's just on the back of a dear friend of his, Stuart Ballantyne, who passed away a couple of days ago. And that really brings home the devastating effect that COVID-19 has had on many of our communities. And, you know, we all know someone who's passed away uh, from COVID-19, it's been such a difficult time. Um, I wonder maybe we could have just a, a moment's silence just to remember those who have been the victims of COVID-19 just before we begin. Okay, thank you for that. Now, it's, it's my honour to introduce you to a very distinguished panel. Uh, we have Imam Saeed Rizawi, Chief Imam of the Scottish Alobet Society. We have the Most Reverend Mark Strange, Primus of the Scottish Episcopal Church, the Most Reverend Leo Cushley, Archbishop of St Andrews and Edinburgh, and the Right Reverend Dr Martin Thayer, Moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. And tonight, uh, we're having an interview conversation on the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects. And I thought we'd begin by asking you all just a, a, a few easy questions to begin with, um, as we, we kind of go into to discussion about how we've all been affected um, by this pandemic. Um, first of all, um, the first easy question that I was wanting to ask, well, maybe easy, maybe, maybe not, but um, what challenges has COVID-19 presented to you as a faith leader and how have you managed to preserve and nurture your own faith at this challenging time? Uh, who, who would like to take that question first? Mark, yeah, thank you. That. I, I, I think I will probably, I, I'd been on um, retreats in on Lindisfarne in, in Northumberland on, on the, the weekend before we, we, we closed the churches and, and I'd um, Travelled slowly home and um, had begun to think, right, what is it that the church might need to do? What might we need to do to help? What can we, uh, this is not going away. Uh, my, my diary was, was rapidly emptying. And then the horror, and, and, and I, I, I've tried to explain to people what it felt like to be um, a faith leader at the point when you're actually doing the very thing that made no sense, which was closing our churches. The point at which normally we would be leaping into action and finding ways of, 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 of putting more on to enable people to come and pray. And I, I just felt devastated on the night I had to, 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 to write that note to say that the churches would be shut. And also what did that do for me? Because um, it, it's going to church for my morning and evening office. It's, it's a daily sacraments. It's all those things which I've been brought up with suddenly were, were taken away. So the strength of what I needed to be able to, to, to explain to people who were angry, who were upset, people who were beginning to feel frightened. Um, so where did I find my own spirituality to cope with that? And that, that took a while, um, the slowing down and then, and then realizing, well, actually I, I am blessed. I, I, I live north of Inverness on the Black Isle and I have many, many miles of woodland. Um, and then re-engaging in a way with, the, with that community of, 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 of nature. Uh, sort of helped me me through that but it, 
it, it was when people began to, to, to contact you to say that so and so's ill or mm. somebody somewhere else, and you could do nothing about being with them. But I suppose it reminded me, and it's still doing so, that, that actually prayer is not anything to do with geography. It's to do with a relationship with God. And, and, and hopefully that the prayers I can offer here in the middle of nowhere on the Black Isle is, are just as valuable as it would be if I was in the office in Edinburgh. Thank you for that. Archbishop Kishle, I'm looking to you. Sure, of course, I'll have a go. Ian. Um, no, I, I share a lot of those, those sentiments that, that Mark has expressed. Um, but uh, I, I, I didn't find it difficult to, to be here on my own, apart from having to learn how to iron sheets on an iron board, uh, because I don't usually have to worry about stuff like that. Uh, but, uh, but I didn't mind having to go and join the queue to buy my food or get exercise because I was being ordered out of the, the house by, by uh, the Prime Minister or the, former, uh, the, the, the First Minister. And I, I found that, in fact, instead of scurrying around and running and going at 100 miles an hour with my hair on fire, that, uh, <laughs> that I was gaining order. I was starting to pick up on a lot of things I have been putting off for ages. So I tried my best to use the time uh, well, personally. Um, but as, as Mark said, I, uh, as people of, of faith, to see our churches and other places of worship having to close was something quite unprecedented. Um, I think we all look to, uh, to, to God and to, to be able to worship and to entrust these things to him. And, uh, and we were able to do that in private prayer. But, um, but we found ourselves, um, our, our public prayer, being pushed online instead. Um, and so I found myself reflecting upon the fact that many people were... We're, we're gathering virtually to worship, um, but nonetheless, it's, it's still real. We're still gathering, even though we're doing it in ones and zeros on the internet. Um, it, is, it is real for all that um, and deeply felt at a human level. Um, but we all know at the same time that we are, we are made for collaboration. We're made to work together. We're made to work with each other. Just like our opposable thumb is about working together, so we are meant to, to work with each other and we do miss that at the human level. Um, that's difficult to replace and I, I hope it's a lesson that we're, we're going to learn. Thank you. Said. So a lot of that what's been said resonates with me completely. I guess at the beginning of the lockdown, I felt quite relieved actually not to travel. So I thought um, after eight years of living and through actually, I've got three or four different suitcases depending on where I'm going and the size of them. So I thought finally it's time to relax. But I think after a week or so, you start getting a bit edgy. So I thought to myself, well, you know, without human contact, it's becoming quite difficult. Um, and then after that, when you get the calls in of people who, uh, they were dying because of COVID-19 or people who fell sick. And then you had a whole issue with economics, mental health, the elderly. And so I guess very quickly, you move towards what you know best, and that's God. Uh, you, I guess, as, been, as has been mentioned, you move to private prayer. And the absolute God that we all worship is not just my God or your God, but he's the creator of the whole universe. And, and, I, and I feel that when people pray, um, sometimes we have personal prayer, but sometimes it's collective prayer. And I find that every household really was, there was some kind of a collective prayer going on, even though we couldn't come together, but we were together in terms of the connection, it's like the networks. And I guess regardless of which, whichever faith we follow, but people praying is profound. And, and I guess that's really what changed my mind frame to think on the basis that the best thing we can do, taking a lesson from the life of Jesus, is serving others. And sometimes you find within service there's a lot of peace and it brings peace to the hearts. And of course, as Muslims, we also believe in Jesus. And so service can be done online. And there we were trying to help people via the internet or phone calls. Uh, trying our best 
Um, but I guess part of getting through this is that the collective love and especially the distinguished panel that I'm here with, who are all friends, um, calling each other, texting each other, just making sure each other's okay. And that brings back hope in humanity, I guess. That refines the goodness. It shows that religion or people of faith are good people and they resonate God. So I think that that for me also was quite filling. And yeah, I think those two things, personal prayer and the sense of community, especially in Scotland, if you, you know, if you look at the rest of the country, if you look at England, I don't think that those things were there in the way that Scotland was able to come together, both as civic Scotland and as religious communities, faith communities. There's something very unique happening. And, you know, we're working together to take ourselves out of, out of this test that we're in. It's very interesting and may return and ask you about why things are, are, are different here and I'm particularly interested I think maybe later we'll talk a little bit about community and, and what community now now means. It was quite interesting that you made the point there that uh, felt quite strongly that uh, you've been able to come together in community. Um, I'm interested to, to find out as, as we explore what that means for other people. Martin, how, how has it been for you? First of all, I was going to say, Ian, if you could ask me last on each occasion, then I'll just be able to say ditto, 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 <laughs> all, all the way around. Well, maybe I should make you go first next time. Then. <laughs> um, I'm in a somewhat different position from uh, my colleagues and friends here tonight who hold office over a longer period of time. Mm. Uh, obviously, the moderator of the General Assembly serves for one year. And so... It has clearly been a very different year to any and all of my predecessors and that from the very outset with the cancellation of our General Assembly in May. Um, Leo used the word unprecedented. Well, this was the first cancellation of the General Assembly since 1689. Wow. So that gives you the sense of how unusual this year has been. So we have had to handle it like everybody else. There's no reason why the church should have been exempt from all of the struggles and the challenges that the whole of our uh, society has had to face. I think personally speaking, of course, I have my own prayer life, but I'm not sure I appreciated just how much it meant to me coming together with brothers and sisters regularly to worship. And not to have that has really been hard to bear. Um, again, I take the point, as with others, that we've done so much online by, a by way of worship. And I'm thankful for the technology. Without it, we would have been sunk. But, my goodness, I wouldn't want the prospect of online worship for the rest of my days. And I long for the possibilities again. Some point next year, we hope sooner rather than later, to be able to come together again. By way of supporting the church, and in particular supporting my colleagues in ministry, one of the things that I've done through these months uh, has been old school technology, and I've been picking up the phone uh, to, to ministry colleagues. I'm now between four and 500 uh, phone calls made to ministers, and while that may seem something of a burden, um, it's been a real privilege because they've opened up to me about how they've been feeling, how they've been managing. I've listened to them as they've spoke, spoken about weariness, um, but at different times about enthusiasm and encouragements that they've had. And might I say, without being too presumptuous, that it seems to me that God has absolutely been at work in this business of phoning colleagues. Um, the numbers of times that I have called a minister and it has just been the right day that I called them. Now my phoning's been entirely random and yet I phoned one colleague for example who that morning had been told that he'd been diagnosed with a very serious cancer. Uh, I was able to spend time with him on the phone and to pray for him. On another occasion I spoke to a, friend, a colleague who tragically uh, had had his divorce confirmed that morning. To say that he was devastated and 
broken would be an understatement, and yet that was the day I happened to phone him. I spent an hour with him and prayed with him. That's what I mean by saying that somehow in his providence, I think God's been in this and I've been at the right place at the right time. So I think even once my year is done, I'll look back on this phoning business and see it as having been one of the highlights and one of the privileges of my role. And yet if you'd said to me beforehand, you'll get to spend a year phoning people, I'm not sure I would have been that excited about the prospect, but that's where I am now. Wow, um, I pick, just picking up on that, and Martin, I think maybe continue, I was going to ask the next question was about how we actually have managed to maintain that community at this time. I mean, it was interesting, though, so he did mention that he, he, he still felt very much that we were in community. Um, what does community look like now? Um, you know, how have you managed to continue to, to keep that, that, that sense of community and people still coming together? I think it's very difficult in the, in the physical and in, in church environment with the, the limited numbers, the physical spacing that's required and, uh, and the lack of singing, for example. If I just use my own congregation for, uh, as an example, Ian, mm -hmm. we're a very uh, together group of people. I love observing the people arriving uh, in the sanctuary on a Sunday morning as a rule. They come together. You see the strength of, of fellowship that's there, one after another coming in, offering uh, hugs to one another or handshakes for the more formal. But they're coming together. They're sharing what's been going on in their week. They're anticipating worship. So, yes, we can come into our buildings now. But when you strip away that fellowship aspect of it, that ability to join together before or afterwards with coffee and so on, you're taking away something that's at the very heart of it. For me, the faith has two dimensions. Let me describe it this way. There is the vertical, which is between us and our creator God. And there is a horizontal, which is us and our brothers and sisters. And it's as if at the moment that horizontal bit has those restrictions and limitations on it that we're not able to enjoy fellowship in the same way. So we have to work doubly hard to make sure that continues in other ways. I think my colleagues will probably go on to say similarly, um, by digital means, by uh, phoning, by written means, whether that's by newsletters or communications, um, every which way, working hard to make sure that we keep in touch one with another. Um, you know, it's easy to get out the habit. There are habits in life in our day, some of them for the better, some of them for the worse. We've got to maintain those habits of keeping ourselves in community one with another. I don't claim to have an answer, I say we're working it out as we go along. Martin, could, could you maybe come in there? What, what challenges has, has COVID-19 presented to you as a community and how have you managed to maintain it? Maybe. Yes, if you could come in, Mark, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think within the community itself, because the, 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 the natural uh, worshipping um, instinct of most Episcopalians is to come to receive the sacrament on a, on a, on a Sunday or, or, mm. or, or during the week, then the, the ability to provide um, a familiar liturgy, um, whether that was through digital means or um, well, largely through digital means, um, that then actually meant we, we as a province, the bishops themselves took each Sunday in turn and we're still doing that. So the people actually were, were led through their worship and, 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 and engaged in their worship in a way they recognised. Because that brought its own community issues because they weren't receiving. So there were, there were lots of theological questions about receiving bread and wine. Uh, and now that we're back in our buildings, it's, it's, I, was, I was in the cathedral in Inverness on Sunday, and it does seem odd. Um, the maximum number we can have is 50, so that there was quite a lot of space. But at the moment that we came together for the sacrament, 
then you can almost see it's great this this process of watching people's eyes at the moment because you know, that's that, that, that's all we can see but watching people's expressions as they began to, to come forward so there's a sense in which the community was maintained in that way even though at the same time that caused some frictions for those who, who were unable to receive so all those things about digital a number of the, the, the congregations that I serve in this diocese, um, they only gather once a month anyway, and they go elsewhere for the rest of the, the time. Um, so the, the initial shock was probably a little bit less. Mm -hmm. um, but there is that sense that, I think one of the lovely stories I heard was an elderly lady in, in, in part of um, uh, another diocese, but, but close to me, who had been a, a faithful member of the church for many years, unable to go to church had been unable to go to church for, for a long time and then suddenly the church began to produce a weekly service the newsletters were arriving and she said for the first time in 12 years she really felt she was part of a worshipping community she wasn't a, a burden to the worshipping community sort of stuck on the edge that someone came along and visited occasionally she felt the same as everyone else and, and she felt her faith being being strengthened by the fact that suddenly um, it wasn't just an expediency. Mm -hmm. She actually felt that she was receiving something. So we've got to think about that because I suspect that as time moves on, we when we're, we're back in, in, in worship, the worst thing we can do is forget those who can't join us. We've got to maintain something of bringing worship in that sense to them as well. So I'm very aware of having to work to, make, to maintain that. One of the things which I found quite remarkable was our young people. Um, there's an annual youth camp that the Episcopal Church has, which, which actually I used to run, but um, the, the leadership of that group put together a whole week's program, which the young people could, could share from home. Um, and, and the number of people who contacted me, parents particularly, to say how remarkable that even though they couldn't be together, they were able to, um, to maintain that sense of community. So I think my greatest fear is that when it's all, whatever me, all done means, we all go, phew, and we go back to the, what, the, the bit we like, you know, which is, I mean, I'm a gregarious person. I like to be amongst people. Yeah. But I think we'll need to remember that the, the, the things we've learned, we need to keep doing, not just because it's attracting new people to faith, but actually it enables some of those who were drifting to the side to once again feel they really are part of the church. And I think that's important. I think that's important for people of faith everywhere. To, to know that they, uh, as their age or their, their ill health diminishes their capacity to be part of the fellowship, that we have to find ways of enabling them to feel part of the community. It's, it's very interesting. I, I, I've had a number of people actually telling me that, they're, to echo what you said, that there have been some people who have felt more in community online because they have been able to be open and share their emotions and their feelings in a way that they weren't able to do when they attend the church or, or, or place of worship in, in some occasions, it's been other faith communities where they've been stuck in a kind of routine uh, and they'll come and they'll listen and then they go there with the tea, they go or they go without actually saying how they're feeling or, or sharing some emotion and actually online, they'd be more prepared to say, look, actually, I'm not coping very well at the moment or, you know, I do need help or, you know, would you pray with me? Which, which is something they just wouldn't have done. They would have just sat in complete silence in church. So it's yeah. interesting to hear what you were saying there, Mark. The chat, the chat room, the chat rooms on 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 the on the Sunday morning worship are, are the most telling places to to spend a few minutes, as as people across Scotland are, are saying hello to each other. And as you said, saying you know my my, my brother's not well or something. Can you pray for them? And that might have taken weeks for that to, to go through the other system, but it's instant and people are doing that prayer now. It's, got, it's very powerful. Good to hear. Said, would you like to come in? That's, uh, so for our community, I guess, our community is a relatively younger community. And, you know, our transmigration began just after World War I. So it's, uh, it's come up to 100 years. Um, but it is, in the grand scale of things, relatively new. And because of that, we have a philosophy which is um, we gather around the mosque. The entire community is based around the mosque. When you marry, it's mosque. When you die, it's the mosque. If there's any issues on a Thursday night, maybe people can come together, have a discussion. 
Um, we found students who were coming into Scotland, who were studying in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen, or wherever it was, they would come to the mosque, they didn't have a place to stay if they needed help. So I guess it was a huge mechanism of support for community members. But then we have this lockdown that takes place. And I, I'm very impressed with the way that the community reacted um, because they listened to everything that was being said. And, and again, we gather on a Friday or a Thursday night um, as a community to come and pray together. So our prayers in the mosque are communal. And when that's not there, it makes it rather difficult, especially with the elders. So the elders would come because it was a social more than anything else. They'd have a nice cup of tea afterwards, probably grab a samosa. And, you know, they were happy. And all of a sudden, now you've got to go and sit at home. And of course, you can get the cup of tea. But the gossip's not there. You know, the chat's not there. So now what do you do? So as has already been said, everything kind of goes online again. So when everything goes online, it was quite interesting because I remember giving a sermon just before the month of Ramadan. And it was interesting because it said eight o'clock sermon, 8.30 close, 8.35, join each other with a cup of tea. So it's everybody lifting their mugs up at about 8.35, um, just to show that, you know, that they're all <laughs> together in this. And I think that that was really important. And then, and then the test comes in the month of Ramadan. How do you bring the community together? And there we are, we've got these online sermons which are taking place. But I guess for me, the biggest test really was in the month of Muharram, which is really our communal month, um, which was towards the end of August. And, you know, I was driving into Dalkeith and the entire mosque had become a studio, basically. So we've got all these lights and, you know, these kind of wires and so forth that I've never experienced before. And <laughs> there we were connecting Australia to Europe, to Scotland, to the United States and all in different time zones. And the support that we had, and again, it, we, even within Scotland, we had Edinburgh, Glasgow, and we had Aberdeen, and they were co-hosting these 10 night lectures that you've been to a couple of years ago, if you remember coming to yes. we'd live in Edinburgh. So, so we were co-hosting and, and it was amazing how people were coming together and how Muharram is a time of mourning. So how you can do collective mourning over the internet. And of course, you know, there were, we had five or six people who were coming just to make the atmosphere and were allowed, of course, for the social distancing and everything else. And I think the only challenge we did have were, was somebody phoning and saying, well, when is it my turn to come? And so you could see people were engaging. And of course, there's only a limited amount of people you can bring in and over 10 days, let's say, even if you have a rotation system, it's very difficult. Um, but I think our community has fared quite well. There has been a sense of community. And I think with the, with the wider community also, so that's our community, but I guess with the wider community, and I think it comes down to leadership, and I think um, be it the churches, or really the interfaith kind of networks that we have, it's based on friendship. You know, we've been working for years on this, and this is why we were able to combat scapegoating, bigotry, xenophobia, which our neighbors were unable to combat straight away. And, and you saw the churches coming very hard on that. Statements were being given, People were coming together and I think that's the beauty and this is why I said Scotland has managed to handle it very differently. You know, you look at France today, they've not been able to handle it. You're looking at different parts of Europe today, even America, they've not been able to handle it. Scotland has and there is a formula and I guess that formula comes down to the fact that we live what we preach and the leadership within Scotland, with the faith communities, with the civic communities do and that and it's what you call their wise people there's a difference between just people cramming knowledge and knowing the philosophy behind it and knowing the theory but there's something different there's something very wise about implementing all of that and as you can see our church leaders were there at the forefront implementing that and i think that's what gives comfort that whichever situation we're in we have a model at the moment which is working and i pray that it continues like this and it's really based upon friendship it's based upon this acceptance of diversity. You can be you and I can be me. And there's no judgment, judgment is suspended. And let's work together and that's what we've been doing. And I think that's a model that other communities, countries, or even our neighbors across the border can learn from, is that how do we work together? And we've been doing that, minus the xenophobia or the scapegoating or you know, pointing fingers at one another. So I do feel that Scotland is a different dynamic. And I do feel that we have something to offer and it's very unique 
and it's not found anywhere else, unfortunately, at, at least at this moment in time, unless if you're living in New Zealand, which is close to heaven on earth at this moment. And <laughs> like, it's, it's top down though, isn't it? Over there, it's leadership. You know, when your leader lives wisdom, you know, when your leader applies to your, themselves first and then other people, that's when you have that kind of a utopia. And okay, I haven't been able to travel to New Zealand in the last seven months, but what I hear from people over there, their prime minister's phenomenal. Not that our first minister isn't, but maybe our prime minister may have an issue. So let's see, anyway, let's see how things develop without making any political statements. Wow, well, we covered an awful lot and uh, one question there, but um, I, I, take, I take that point and, it, and, it, and it's, um, it's very good to know that, that, that I mean, you spend a lot of time around the world, you spend a lot of time in London and other countries to know that there is something special happening in, in Scotland and it doesn't happen overnight. You see, it's taking many years between faith communities, interfaith organisations, you know, Edinburgh Interfaith Association last year celebrated its, its, its 30th anniversary. And, uh, you know, so I think it's over so many years, you start to develop those relationships and people know who you are. And as you say, you you reach out to people. You, 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 you cease to become just a leader or you become a, a human, a brother, a father. Um, and we, we, you know, we, we care for each other and, and how our families are doing. And, and that there's a sense of Scotland of, you know, micro community, maybe in, 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 in a larger community. Uh, and there's a sense that we're all in community, which is, which is, uh, which is a special one. As you say, I'd like to think that in some way our political read readers recognise the value of faith uh, and the contribution that faith communities make. And I think only I mean, during this time, during the pandemic, I think it's been very visible to see how faith communities have come to the forefront with food banks, uh, with so many other ways that they've been helping the vulnerable during this time. Um, so it's very important to hear that. And anyway, Archbishop Kishley, you've been sitting there <laughs> quietly listening to that. Uh, <laughs> can you remember the questions <laughs> about the challenges uh, around uh, COVID-19 and, and, and how you know, you've managed to maintain that community? Sure, we're, uh, we're, doing, we're doing okay, I think, uh, but, but they, I've been surprised very pleasantly by some of the things that have happened, Ian. Um, I, just, I just want to, to back up uh, what Syed was saying, though, before I answer that. Um, I, think, I think Syed's right about that. Um, but it's difficult for, for us to tell Syed. You travel quite literally the, the world and you can see the way that your people are are welcomed or or not and treated or not treated well um, as the case may be um, so i take comfort from from what you say and i'm glad that uh, that, that you're able to report that to us and um, it's diffi more difficult for us to see it because this is where we live and work we don't quite have a global parish the way that you do um, i have global experience but not of any uh, recent nature and uh, and now that i'm here this is this has become my my parish, my world. So I, I take comfort from that, but I don't think we should um, take your word for it. I don't think we should rest on our laurels side. I think we have to. If it's true, let's let's make it better. And if it's not true, let's keep let's work to make it so. Um, but I'm very grateful to hear what you said um, about that friendship and collaboration. I completely agree um, that that friendship is is the basis for this. It's it's that we we share a common humanity and uh, and and we all have at heart the the common good as as well as what we what we share in our in our faith in one God. Um, at least this this particular group of people here just now. Um, but that uh, for all of our friends in the Interfaith Association and so on, it's, it, 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 we do have a lot in common and it starts with our, our common humanity and our wish for the common good. And I think if we keep that um, at the centre of what we try to do, then we can't go too, we can go too badly wrong. Um, back to your question, <laughs> Ian. Um, I think a lot of people were or are even afraid that because our churches and mosques and other places of worship are, are, are very, they're not closed and we have to congratulate um, the Scottish Government in keeping our places of worship open uh, compared to everywhere else in the British Isles right now. And, and I am very, very pleased to see that. I can't tell you how pleased I am to see that. 
And I know that Mark works on that and it represents us from, from the Kirk as well, George. And uh, I don't think, Martin, maybe you sit in the meetings sometimes too. And uh, Bishop Hugh Gilbert, who's the president of the Catholic Bishops Conference, and they all report back to broader groups of, of faith leaders. And that contact that we've had with the government uh, seems to have let them understand um, it more clearly the importance that faith has to a very, very great number of voters. And so that's a good thing for us all. Um, but uh, nevertheless, do you, I think still because we have as the upper limit 50 people, no matter the size of the building that you've got, as Mark pointed out. And um, there is a fear among my clergy, my people too, that there will, we, will, we will lose the kind of momentum of, of gathering at, in a weekly basis in greater numbers and, and that, that uh, maybe, maybe we're all doomed and it's all going to be terrible. I, I'm, I'm not completely convinced by that. Um, and I'll tell you why. Um, I've spoken to a couple of my parish priests who have noticed that people are, are coming, they, that the, 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 the parishioners are coming, their people are coming back to worship, but they're doing it, they're doing it smartly, they're doing it intelligently. If they can't all be there on a Sunday, um, they maybe leave it a Sunday so that other people can go and then they'll go the next week and things like that. And they're doing it with this, and it's good to hear that. I think that's, that's, that's a good solution to the problem. Another thing, that, that I, I found was the very first day that we were allowed to open up places of worship. Um, I went down to my cathedral down in the middle of the city here in Edinburgh and, and I, I saw a few of the old faces and um, they were so pleased. They were so pleased. They, 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 they had tears in their eyes and I don't know the last time they had tears in their eyes about going to church. It, it's, and it was lovely to see to their great surprise, they really missed going to Mass. They really missed being able to go in to pray um, in, in the house of God. And, uh, and I think it was a great reminder to them. But as I say, a great surprise to, to us all to say, hey, we really miss this. This is a good thing. And we've taken it for granted for our entire lives. Um, there, there's not a time that any of us knows when we couldn't just walk into a place of worship. Um, and to have that taken away from you peremptorily um, has made people sit up and think. Um, and that's providential. Martin was talking about this being providential and the hand of God in, in what is going on. And I, I think that's part of it, that, that we're, we've been taught a lesson that we can't always control stuff. I think we, we, we've got awfully proud in our, in our present in our present society, in our present culture, and we think we can do anything, and we can't. This, this is teaching us a sobering and a wholesome lesson that, that some things are beyond our control. And you know what? That's fine. Um, a little humility would do us all a lot of good. And to learn to, to respect each other a little bit more, to, to learn to that the, the precious nature of the friendships that we have with each other. And I don't know. I, maybe it's just because I'm, I'm wired this way, but that, that gives me a little bit of hope for the future, that maybe we can learn one or two good lessons about that. Thank you. And I, I would just echo that. Um, the, the, the Scottish Government has been listening. I mean, I am also uh, regularly attend one of those meetings mm -hmm. uh, to represent the Edinburgh Interfaith Association and Maureen Sire represents uh, Interfaith Scotland just to, to, to give a voice to, to wider faith communities who, who maybe aren't part of those conversations. Obviously, they the main churches and, and, and the, the larger faith groups are represented there, but they, they have been trying their hardest to, to keep places open where they can with, with, with safe guidelines. Um, kind of just uh, reminding that there are people watching here on Zoom, and uh, you're more than welcome to think about questions that you might want to put into chat um, just in a minute. If you have another question of your own that's really burning, please uh, pass it also on to us. But um, for the moment, I, I would like to pick up on something that Leo, uh, Archbishop Kishlu was mentioning at the end, which is about lessons. You, you know, you, you've mentioned there's a lesson there for us in humility. What other lessons are there for us from the pandemic? You know, what lessons are there for us as, as for you as faith leaders? Um, what 
lessons are there for our communities? You know, what lessons are there for wider society? Can I go first? Yes, yeah, please, please okay, do. Okay, then, and then you You're can all afraid. jump in and tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> um, I, I am tempted to look for the big answer and the big meta-narrative. And I, I have to tell myself to be prudent about this because I like it tied up and dusted and judged and decided and it's done and then we can go on. And I have to resist the temptation to do that. I think um, it's a little bit early um, to see where this is all going. So that's why I sort of say to myself, Leo, take it easy. We don't, we don't know how this is all going to play out. And so I can only say for myself that uh, I hope that we'll learn, that we'll learn some lessons, um, that we will build back better, that we will build back better prepared and that we will pick up on some of the good lessons we've learned. Like maybe we don't need to be flying around the world, apart from Syed, he can fly around. Uh, we don't need to be flying around the world all the time. Um, we don't need to go to meetings that are all over the country all the time, that the internet can help us save an awful lot of time and do things in a more practical way. And again, remember that, that people are real and they're more important than anything else. So that's my go anyway. Thank you. Martin. First of all, I think I just want to echo that. Um, there is always a tendency for folks to say, what is God saying to us through this present pandemic and so on? I think people have been doing that since the beginning of time. Um, I read the most interesting book, God and the Pandemic, by the, the well respected theologian and prolific writer Tom Wright, N.T. Wright. And he, he deals with this question, what, what is God saying to us through the pandemic? And he, he urges caution in terms of responding to that question. Um, it's far too easy to leap to conclusions. Oh, it's the end of the world. Oh, you know, it's this or that. Um, Tom Wright says this, and clearly he's articulating a, a, a Christian position. He says that there's nothing that God is going to say to us through a pandemic or anything else that he has not already said to us through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, and I, I like that from Tom Wright. In other words, there's nothing new. There's nothing that God has not revealed to us through scripture and through Christ. So there may be tweaking messages, if I can put it that way, through things like pandemic. But the love of God made known in Christ is the defining message always. So what is God saying to me now is in a sense the same as what God said to me yesterday and will be again tomorrow. The tweaking, if I can put it that way, may be again going back to what Leo said earlier. This sense of humility, I think recovering of humility, and our dependence on God. I quoted when I was installed as moderator a verse from the book of Proverbs. And in the translation that I was using, it says this, We may make our plans, but God has the last word. Now, if I apply that to myself, I came into the role of moderator and 80% of my diary was in place, a whole year's worth of planning. And within two weeks, it was wiped clean. <laughs> so we make our plans, but maybe it is a time for us to be reminding ourselves of the sovereignty of God, that there is a creator and there are creatures. And there's a difference between the two. And we need to humbly be before God, uh, trusting him in all of this. Uh, and I think that is about humility. And I think that's a key lesson for these days. Thank you, Martin. Said. I think it's very difficult to uh, say what God wants or what God is trying to indicate. If I had the answer to that, they'd call me a prophet. And we believe in the finality of prophethood 1400 years ago. So there's, there's no way I can speak for God or what he wants. Um, but I guess the first thing that comes into my mind is really 
and unfortunately I have to say this, but the rebellious nature of human beings. We were in lockdown. The minute that lockdown kind of was lifted, go back to the summer, everybody went back to doing what they were doing. And, you know, I remember having a conversation on the climate just in preparation for COP26 and people were talking about carbon emissions and everything else. And I said, look, my biggest fear is that, okay, fine, at the moment we're doing wonderfully well and all sorts of animals are coming out onto the roads and vegetation is growing and all that stuff. But I thought, look, the minute that we're out of this pandemic, we're going to see a shootout of carbon emissions and all sorts of other issues because we want to recover the economy as fast as we can to get back to those targets that we were hitting maybe a year ago. And exactly is what happened. You know, we come out of lockdown, let's say, we have regional lockdowns, whatever it was, bang. You found pollution increased, rubbish all over the place. Um, those very animals that had come out, they'd gone back to the hideouts again. You know, we saw a lot of issues take place and we saw, and this is what I saw, you know, was going down the road, going to, let's say, to the local Tesco's or Sainsbury's or what you may have it, people were intolerant. You know, people wanted to jump queues, they were angry, they didn't want to wear masks, you know, and then all of a sudden laws have been changed or not changed, but recommendations have been given fine if they go in without the mask, don't, you know, you don't need to penalize people and so forth. So I think that whatever we'd learnt, it was out of, I guess it was out of force that we learnt it, but the minute that things were made free for us again, it's just the nature of the human being that we become rebellious if we're not trained. And, and I guess then I, I came to appreciate at least religion and the parameters that religion has drawn up, that we do have an ethical or moral code. We do have the golden rule, what you want for yourself or for other people. And I think the reason being is this, is that we don't want to hurt other people. Otherwise, if you allow your rebellious nature to go wild, you see the reaction to that. And, you know, and I was actually in London on the day when London went into lockdown. That night, people were partying as if it was 1999 coming into 2000. So when you look at that, and then all of a sudden you wonder why is it spiked? COVID is spiking again. So, you know, I think that's one thing. Um, and I think the second thing is that really resonated with me is in terms of physical meeting. You know, just I think about a, a number of weeks ago is texting Ian Torrance and he says something very, very phenomenal, you know, really got to me. He said, there's nothing that is a substitute for physical meeting. There's something about the human touch. Human beings have been made social creatures for a reason. That's why we come together to worship. If we take the philosophy that, you know, we can worship God individually, we have private prayer. But there is something that God wants for us to come together and worship. And it's more fulfilling at times. You know, that whole idea of communal worship is very fulfilling. So, yes, there's a lot of things we can do via Zoom or Microsoft or other forms and means and processes. And, of course, I'm going to take a, a leaf out of Leo's book and I'm not going to travel as much either. So, however... <laughs> There's no substitute for physically being with somebody, embracing people, talking to people, um, just sharing, I guess, energies, as they would say, as the modern word is now, energies or spirituality, each other's spirit or whatever it may be, whatever the new modern words are. Um, but I think that age old, you know, it's like Adam has just been ejected from heaven. You know, if you look at it like this and he's feeling very lonely or in fact, even before that, before being ejected from heaven, he's very lonely. So God creates Eve for him. So I think that there, there is kind of a, something there within relationships, which I think we can't substitute. So, but again, the final word on this is there needs to be a balance. Um, and I think that if we can just attain that balance, then perhaps we can save our economy, our societies, you know, the environment, um, reduce carbon emission and everything else. So I think it comes down to human balance. Very interesting. There's a lot what you've said there to unpack. Um, I mean, Martin was mentioning there about the book of God and the pandemic. And certainly there, are, there have been people out there, you know, throwing these questions out to people if they're saying, you know, where is your God during, during this pandemic? Um, but so you do meet, meet a lot of very important points is that, we have a knock-on effect and many of the actions that we do are affecting the world around us and we're always very quick to try and blame we, we, it's part of the human nature 
we either scapegoat people in our society or at times people try to scapegoat God. But in fact, we have to look at the actions that we have that pollute, that knock on our environment, that bring on these diseases and many of the other natural disasters that we have around us. Really interesting. And again, at the end, I think we'll come back to this whole idea about community. You've, you, you've mentioned this thing about balance. Uh, and I think everybody would agree you can't completely move to online community. We miss human contact. We miss, you know, sometimes we have to put our arms around one another. People need that hug at times. They need that human contact. But maybe going forward, we, we might be in this for a while longer. And we have to think of how we might adapt to a blended approach to this. Mark, if you keep it brief, if you can, there are one or two other questions coming in from people that I want to throw out to our audience. Yeah, there's not much I can add to to any of that. I mean, one of the one of the things I think which which I have learnt um, and 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 rediscovered uh, comes about what the community feel about places of worship. We 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 worked on a basis where people felt indifferent or or or, or not not bothered. We just didn't exist, uh, and and we retreated, uh, and 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 many of us just sort of stuck to what we did with our own communities um, on one of the evenings where there was, there was a particular issue going on in 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 the in, in the uk and in, in scotland um with the death levels etc I, I decided to to ring the church bell from the wee church in my garden um the bell occasionally gets rung on a sunday morning and you know but we don't we don't broadcast ourselves so i rang the bell because it just seemed the appropriate thing to do and my email lit up with people who never darkened the door of the building but just suddenly saying thank you, thank you, because we know you're still there. Um, we, we're aware, and, and suddenly I'm thinking, to, right, that's it. From now on, every Sunday, every bell rings, every 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 moment something has to happen. So that sense of that that we somehow talk ourselves down by saying, well, people aren't interested. But actually, what I found were people were desperate to know that they might not be praying, but that we still were. Mm. And the other thing that 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 that, that has been very formative to me is that. I can talk about interfaith matters. I can talk about the relationship. I can talk about how um, we can be nice together. And I've watched that change through my life in Scotland. I mean, we have to, it's not that long before these conversations weren't happening. But what was really formative for me is actually listening to people of other faiths saying to me, if you stick with us, we'll stick with you about buildings. We'll stick with you through this process. We can help each other. And suddenly, rather than just because I'm a nice, friendly person, I felt that there was a need and a reason for our relationship. And it, it wasn't, what can I get out of this? It's how can I help the other parts of this community get through this? And, and I, I felt that was good. I can be quite intolerant at times. And this talk, <laughs> people daring to drive up the track past my house, you know, I don't want them here. And suddenly realize that when they stopped and said, Bishop Mark, can we have a conversation? Actually, everything's an opportunity. And, and interfaith work we've done has actually enabled us through our friendships to be able to support each other, even if it wasn't a benefit for us, but benefit for others. And I think that is a real lesson I want to hold on to. That is wonderful, Mark. I'm just going to squeeze in a couple of questions that have come in for our audience. Uh, the first question come, comes from Farhana. How are the faith communities supporting the people who have lost so many loved ones through the pandemic and wider reasons? Has there been a coordinated response from the interfaith groups? It's an interesting question. Yeah, let me just offer one, one quick response to yes, Ian, uh, Leo and Mark and myself. Um, on behalf of our Christian communities, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, on the occasion of All Saints Day, we offered a service together which was largely about uh, making space for people to express loss and also thanksgiving for those who uh, have gone ahead of us. So that was one way. Um, I mean, much more, but I'm trying to say that we were deliberate in doing that. Um, and I think I could have done it, they could have done it, but sometimes it is good to do things together to, to express our, our togetherness and everything else. Thank you. Yeah. Would I think we all found it pretty tough though, Ian. I mm. think it's it's been tough because because of the limited numbers, especially during lockdown, ten people is is a tragedy at the funeral because 
you've got to do a triage of who's going to be, who are your loved ones, when, especially in a big family. Um, and they, one of, I did a funeral of a priest who died of COVID and, uh, and his, he was from a big family. Uh, there were 10 of them and, they, and they're all, you know, uh, parents and grandparents and kids and all the rest of it. They had to choose between who was going to go to the, to the ceremony and who was going to go to the graveside. And, uh, and it was very sad. So, and all you can do is, is be there with people. It's, it's very, very tough. But I'm sure everyone's got a similar story to tell. Yeah, Said. I'm just looking at the question, rereading it. Um, I think that the interfaith communities have responded by coordinating with the government quite well on this. Because remember, this is issue of, an issue of mental health. We don't have the resources to be able to um, help each and every individual, or at least we as a community, as the Muslim community, don't have that kind of a resource. But the one thing that all of us have done is we've highlighted to the Scottish government that there is a need. And in fact, the Scottish government has taken the lead on this and they are providing resources for those people who may be grieving, for those people who are suffering from depression, for people who have lost their, lost their loved ones. And of course, we also have a responsibility to talk to individuals. But again, if there's only three or four of us, let's say, there's no way you can cover a whole community. Um, so I think much of this is to do with professionals, um, people who are professional or who have the cr credentials. It's their profession to be able to go and help people, especially in regards to mental health as well. So, you know, I've, I've seen people who, because of the fact that they're grieving, they've, de they've developed anxiety, um, depression, and with the lockdown or unable to meet people freely, it became a problem. The best thing that we can do is, at least when I look at myself, is not to think that I can do the work of a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I just can't, and I need to understand my own limitations. So, you know, I think the one thing that we have done, which I think has been quite important, is to involve the Scottish government. You know, I think for individuals, we have to understand our limitation. I can't do more than this, but I know the Scottish government has resources that they can do. I know that, for example, yourself, as an interfaith organization or the oldest interfaith organization in Scotland and in Edinburgh, you don't have the resources to be able to go to every single door in Scotland and to be able to help. But the one thing that we can do is we can signpost. And I think that's important to say, look, this is our limitation. Let's mm. signpost to the Scottish government, let them take control of that. I'm, I'm very conscious of time. One thing I'd like to say at the, at the Edinburgh Interfaith Association, one thing we've been doing every week is I've been hosting something called Interfaith Insights, which goes live at one o'clock on a Tuesday, which highlights just the positive things that faith communities are doing to support other people during COVID-19. And we're regularly getting between 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people watching those programmes because they are finding that, that the support and the positive stories, that faith is motivating people to help others, to make a difference in society through faith banks, through help caring for the most vulnerable. Uh, and we've been providing also people talking about meditation and uh, yoga and other practices which has helped people during this time. So do do tune into that. I do host that on a Tuesday with my colleague Joe uh, Kobla and Nassim Hazard. Um, one last question. I'm going to go in very quickly, if it's still there, and then we will go. I think it has maybe. Is there a possibility, do you think, that with everyone having had to live with uncertainty for several months now, one of the results of the COVID era might be a revival of faith and in some ways, especially in Europe. I think we've touched on that in a way. Do you think one thing, part of COVID might be a revival of faith? Might that be a positive thing? Well, I think it'd be a positive thing. I don't think anyone's going to challenge you on that one, no, Ian. No, 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 is I'm not saying it's going to happen. Is that realistic? Is it going to happen? Yeah, is, is it, is it going to happen? happen? Well, that remains to be seen. But I can remember the smiles on the faces of those people that I saw going into church who couldn't, who, who were surprised. They were surprised how much they missed it. And they were surprised how much they loved getting back to worship. I mean, so I saw I recently, hope there's something there. I saw recently... A, a, I think, Archbishop, that uh, there was something in the papers about the increase in people who were praying during yeah. COVID-19, that idea that there was an increase in faith. Um, we could just maybe make one or two comments and then we can... Can I think Mark's got something to say? Mark, yes. What was fascinating, um, as, as we were heading towards reopening of buildings, here in Inverness, 
the provost at the cathedral found it wasn't the cathedral congregation coming up to her and saying, when's the cathedral going to be reopening? It was the local community coming up to her and saying, when is the building, when, when are the doors going to be open? Because they, they, the, 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 the worshipping community were worshipping. They were, they were doing all the digital stuff. They were having the contact. It was the people who simply felt the need to go in and, and to light a candle, to go in and add a butterfly to the memorial, the memorial wall. They felt the need just to be in the building. And even if they didn't want to be in it, with the fact they knew they could be. And that's what Leo was talking about. So I've certainly got a lot of people who now stop and speak to me outside the building, who in the past would have just nodded as I went, they went past, morning, Bishop, and carry on. But now <laughs> say, morning, and actually having a conversation. Whether that leads to faith, I don't know, but it certainly is helping me. Wonderful. Um, do we have any other final comments just before we, we I think we, we draw to a close, I think? Very briefly, Ian, I would say yes. this, but uh, I am a, a eternally optimistic, um, and that's because I'm, I'm trusting in God and, and not ourselves. Um, if I thought that faith was over uh, in Scotland or more widely in Europe, or that somehow God was finished with us, then I would leave this present uh, way of life and go and do something more useful, you know, with my life. Maybe something that paid better as well. Um, <laughs> But, um, but I'm, not, um, I'm not doing that because I'm absolutely convinced that faith has a future um, and that communities of faith will continue to be uh, crucial uh, in the life of our nation. So I'm thoroughly optimistic, challenged, of course, but definitely optimistic. Fantastic. I'm just looking around if there are any, any other comments. Um, I, I, I did see someone writing here uh, that perhaps COVID-19 is, is being sent uh, uh, by God as a bit of a wake-up call to us. Um, I don't quite know how to respond to that. That's another question that we could talk for a long time. But certainly we have, during our conversations, talked about uh, the fact that uh, we as humans, we need to maybe be more responsible for our actions and the impact that we have on the world around us. And uh, it, it's been a, a real pleasure and a real honour uh, to be to have this last hour with you, I'd like to thank the Scottish Albate Society for for organising this. Uh, it, it's been my pleasure uh, as the director of Edinburgh to Faith to be to be part of this, and I thank everyone uh, for joining us and for the comments. And there there, there is uh, an, another thing that needs your prayer. The Scotland national team are actually playing a very important game tonight. Um, then maybe you could take some time to to uh, hope that the uh, do well tonight as well. I think someone's maybe departing to check on that. But thank, thank you, thank you again, everyone, for for joining in and uh, stay safe and take care, everyone. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, thank everyone. You.